Yeah, so uh, Tom, if you don't mind sticking around, but uh, Jared, Zach, and Jacqueline, if you don't mind turning your uh, your video screens back on, uh, a couple questions for folks out there, and we'll uh, we'll start with Daniel. Hang on, I'm going to go through and I'm going to hunt you down and ask you all to turn them on. There's one, there's two. Oh, Jared beat, beat me to it. Thank all right, you. Well, good. So we have a... Uh, we have one question again from Sean Berthold out there. This is for Daniel. Um, we agree that there is enormous resistance within large organization, not just the military, to adopting and accepting these changes, uh, design thinking specifically. The, they are so resistant that they aren't even willing to listen. I share this with a colleague recently, uh, and she told me about the ADCAR change management. Have you heard of it? So I did just look up uh, the ad car change management system. So now I have, uh, and that, that, uh, is the acronym awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement that those are the things required to, uh, to, to, uh, manage change effectively. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that sounds pretty solid to me. One of the, one of the biggest issues that I think we face within the innovation realm is this, uh, is this mis misperception about what, innovation should look like. Um, a lot of people think that it's, it's like a process with a, with a good outcome just at the end, you do the process right, and then, and then there's a deliverable. And if you did it right, uh, then there's, there's not like a lot of waste there. Uh, I like to tell people that it, innovation is an extremely inefficient process. There is a ton of stuff that feels like waste, but it is about as wasteful as uh, working out your muscles. Like, you know, the people doing training exercises to prepare for war or those things, those are, we've, we've all accepted that you have to do certain activities to, to maintain readiness with innovation. It's not exactly the same thing. Cause you're not like, uh, you're trying to reach a level of, of like, I like to say potentiation where you're, you've, you're at the peak potentiation for innovativeness, which requires these cultural conditions. And it requires that you have these ongoing practices that facilitate ongoing discovery, that facilitate psychological safety. Um, convincing people to bring those things into their organization when they're only willing to bring in things that have measurable outcomes is impossible. It's uh, so, so especially with something like, you know, design thinking, I like to tell people that if, you know, if we adopt these methods at the very least, it's going to be way more pro productive than uh, the current, our current method of bringing people together and having meetings or trying to come to consensus. So that is one of the immediate measurable outputs that you can show people is, hey, instead of doing your summit the way that you were planning on doing it without a, without a trained facilitator, or, or just with a bunch of people giving PowerPoint presentations, how about you bring in a facilitator and give them that experience? So I see that as part of the change management thing is giving people the opportunity to experience it. Um, but also we have to change this perception of innovation as, um, as a, it, something that can be an efficient process. Because if you're, if you're going for efficiency, then you're converging early. You are... And, and one of the most important things in innovation is that you diverge and you don't converge at the same time. You need to have these divergent processes that put all options, all cards on the table to do maximum exploratory work before you start converging. And if you're asking yourself right now, uh, am I being efficient? Is this the right, you know, like when you do a sticky note exercise or something, I'm like, I don't know if this is the right idea to put on the board. Wrong, it's, it's about quantity. At, during the convergence or the divergent phase of innovation. And we need to convince people of the value of that. I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Daniel. Um, having gone through the Warfighter Center design class uh, through the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting, I have become a practitioner and, and a believer on my own. I, I wish I could have expended some of the knowledge that I've recently gained back in January in my past 10 years in the Marine Corps so, um, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, so I, I helped facilitate uh, the Warfighter Center Design Workshop at uh, Carnegie Mellon University with the United States Marine Corps AI uh, Community of Interest. 
And uh, typically when people hear, uh, you know, the eye rolls, okay, here comes the OPT. This is what we do. We we'll spend a whole week just listening to people talk about themselves and their ideas. Um, and, but it was a sensational feedback and we got some great products. There's still some sausage making you got to do, obviously. There's still products that need to be built, but that divergent and then convergent thinking that brought everyone to the same page and really reached outside the fringes of what a typical meeting can get you to grab those great stickies and those great ideas uh, really fell into our lap through that process and people's eyes kind of widened and they're like, wow, how do we do this in other places? So thanks for fighting the good fight. Um, yeah, absolutely. Me, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, I, the re one of the reasons I like to say potentiation is, uh, it, and I saw somebody mentioned the, the word potentiation being weird in the chat. Potent I, I, potentiation, the way I'm thinking of it comes from uh, neurology. It's like you have these synapses and they don't fire a, a neurological signal between um, these two synapses until one of them reaches a certain state of like excitation or electrical charge. And once it reaches that, it can fire. So I like to think of it in terms of you're trying to get the culture or the, you know, the level of psychological safety to a point where those signals can be continuously firing. Uh, because it's like people won't speak up, people will hesitate to say when they have an idea, for example, unless you have the conditions right, like the leader is approachable or people are, are just working out loud or there is a sufficient psychological safety for people to really not care if other people think their idea is bad. And that's what you want. You want those conditions so that those signals can be continuously firing. And the other thing I like to say is that uh, it, the, the things that we think of as indicators that we're doing the right thing tend to be lagging indicators. They're thing, you know, like in business world, it's um, how much, you, you know, like what our, what our quarterly profits are or, or uh, quarterly earnings. And um, it, those are lagging indicators. Though, those won't actually tell you if you're going to continue to do well. One of the most interesting uh, early indicators for success is actually employee engagement and happiness. Those things can tell you if you are going to see future success in your organization. Um, and, and so I think we kind of have it mixed up. We're like, oh no, it, the most important thing is if we made a profit this quarter. No, actually, like that tells you if you did okay last time. But the only thing that can tell you if you're going to do okay next time are these cultural indicators or these psychological or these leadership indicators. That's valuable insight. Thank you, Daniel. Um, moving on, uh, Jared, this one is over to you. So Devin Smiley asks uh, from the queue, what kind of coordination do you do with Naval Postgraduate School? Seems like a significant source of technical resources and interested Marines. This guy, having been a byproduct of that institution, and now here I am talking to a guy like you. I see that you answered it in the Q&A session, but do you want to el elaborate or extrapolate? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I mean, we did just recently visit them uh, last August as part of a uh, new, um, like they they, they kind of returned it um, logistics operations in a contested environment uh, form. So a little bit of brainstorming there, how to better do things in an EO, EABO construct. But there is, there's a little bit of tie-in, uh, probably not as much as there needs to be, um, but it's essentially just a. Uh, contact with Colonel Pugh over there at NPS and putting people together for creative writing articles, um, as well as some of the latest and greatest research that we try to pair the command and staff uh, students up, up with in particular for their uh, master's in uh, military studies. Um, another thing too is they have a uh, major Eric Kim, he's going to be contributing to our uh, innovation summit, the virtual innovation summit this year. So uh, that's uh, he was identified for coming up with a creative solution using um, essentially like bio AI, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but uh, yeah, using a more biographical or like uh, biometrics to, uh, to identify um, certain potential problems and stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but uh, so that's something that'll be recorded in the, uh, the latter part of this month or early May, and we'll push that out in aggregate with some of the other things. But yeah, it's limited, but it's definitely something we can expound upon more. Um, I know it was kind of brief and uh, very speedy when I went through the, um, the, the PowerPoint there, but um, there's just a few of us in the center. So we're trying to kind of expand that network. So if you have any ideas or anything that you uh, want to pursue in, in, uh, in particular, please let us know. I'll be more happy. 
That's excellent. Thank you. And uh, I will have a question for you, actually, okay. personally, based on my experience at uh, MPS and in the AI sphere and my um, CS background with the Moves Institute as well. But yeah. before that, uh, Sean asks, uh, again for Jared, I'm curious, since the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy, how much integration is there between what you described and Naval X and the CAW, Centers for yeah. Adaptive Warfighting? And is there a different focus for each? Um, John, you probably weigh in on the story. You can weigh in too, man. Um, I think we have a great relationship. I haven't come up and visited your, uh, your facility there in Alexandria and everything else, or at least the, the Naval X side. Um, but really, it is. It's, it's very like-minded. So we're a um, kind of an integrator as well. So, but we are primarily Marine Corps University student-focused. So am I, am I still transmitting here? Looks like a lot of screens have frozen. Okay, so you'll see me. Yep, okay. yep. No, you, you're just, everyone's intently listening. Please. Okay, that's it. Yeah, just focus, huh? Yeah, so we've, we've been primarily uh, MCU student focused for a while. Uh, we are broadening, broadening that apparatus there and trying to, uh, to integrate further. Um, so I know for EWS, Expeditionary Warfare School, it's a captain's level course in the Marine Corps, for those that aren't familiar. Um, we recently paired them up with Naval X, especially those, uh, the logisticians that are focused on added manufacturing and uh, distributed environments and stuff. So it's a, it's a healthy collaborative relationship, if you will. Oh, that's excellent. And uh, John may be able to elaborate on that a little bit. Currently, he had to step out for something, but, but thank you for that response. Um, let's see. Moving along, we've got, uh, so I have a question for you since the question yep. and answer queue is a bit empty. Uh, so again, to everyone who's still listening and paying attention, thank you. Uh, if you have a question for anybody here, please drop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom, wiggle your mouse, have it pop up. Um, and if uh, I've been seeing a lot of questions, people are interested in the slides, please go ahead and leave your request in the Q&A box. Uh, that way we can track it down earlier and we can send it to your Eventbrite email that you use to sign up for this event. Um, so I uh, was graduated from MPS with a master's in computer science and I specialized from moves, the uh, modeling and virtual environment simulations. So I got to play with some virtual headsets, which are currently seeing a resurgence in this uh, social isolation sphere yeah. that we see ourselves in. Really, uh, I'm super happy to see the technology starting to be adopted. A lot of research pointed me to, uh, you know, building trust in AI systems uh, using interfaces. I thought VR was a very interesting way because you could infer quite a bit of uh, human interaction just from posture and body tracking. Um, yeah. But is the is MCU doing anything when it comes to uh, war gaming um, and leveraging uh, virtual reality, augmented reality technologies? So limited, limited when it comes to VR, AR uh, type stuff. So our military innovation chair, Dr. Brandon Valeriano is working with Dr. Benjamin Jensen, who's over at the School of Advanced Warfighting as part of the TCOM Warfighting Society, um, exploring new ways to kind of conduct distributed wargaming and augmented reality in particular. Also, Major Tim Riemann, a uh, current student at SAW, is doing his Innovation Summit presentation on um, modernized and advanced levels of learning to fit the younger generations. Uh, it's kind of like a, everything in a nutshell. So it's exactly that. It's um, It's understanding the preponderance of students, younger students these days, and, and junior Marines in particular, because that's really the target audience, likes things like the graphic novel, which we did with the Destination Unknown aspect, and they like things like YouTube and video game type stuff to kind of teach it and learn it and experience it. So trying to make education more of an experience vice just something you regurgitate and can pull from rote memory. So that is definitely something that's being explored. We've done a little bit with Microsoft HoloLens, um, but it's, a, it's still very much in development. Part of that was gonna be a display uh, at the Innovation Summit. Unfortunately, all the vendors, everything else are now, uh, it's all been kinked, obviously. But um, that is definitely something we're exploring more and more and has a ton of potential. Uh, moving along with higher education, is it only officers uh, or, or just a select few that attend the University of the Marine Corps? Do you train mer uh, enlisted Marines as well uh, from Sean right. in the audience? Yeah, great question. Um, so there, so here on the resident campus um, at MCU between the five schools that we support, uh, which is at the for the captains, expedition warfare school, majors, command of staff, then school of advanced warfare for more. Uh, it's another advanced course for majors, and then uh, the Marine Corps War College uh, for lieutenant colonels, typically post command. 
We also have CME, the College of Enlisted Military Education, who we're partnered with very closely, and they focus on all the staff academies. So everything is across the board. So on the resident campus, we have, give or take, about 700 individuals, but we have 90 plus thousand out in the fleet that uh, all this goes towards. So everything is via Moodle, a distributed environment, and then that's part of the roadshows where we try to get out there and broaden everyone's horizon so they can tie it into the fleet. Real quick anecdote here. Uh, last night, we conducted a, uh, a conference with the, the command team from 12th Marines and some from uh, 3rd MEF on a war game that we recently did with a commercial off-the-shelf game uh, on a 12th Marines augmentation to 3 MEF and the joint force capabilities in the first island chain using, like I said, a commercial game. Um, so there is more of that, and now they're going to download that. We'll go out and facilitate some of it. But it's creating more of this network, this autonomous network that people can kind of operate on their own uh, that we just kind of leverage and build a repository of games, information, everything else to kind of share with people if that makes sense. Excellent. Well, uh, as a consumer of graphic novels, video games, and yeah. things that you say the younger generation does, I appreciate <laughs> I, I, I the compliment, too. and I'm yeah. going to just stick with that move right along. Um, Jacqueline and Zach, so there are a lot of folks out there, uh, I know at McTissa, the Tactical AI Cell specifically as well, um, we wanna get involved, we wanna help. So, and we're aware that there's national mission initiatives out there that Jake's working on. I guess there's also some studies that are being enacted here pretty, pretty soon or, or ongoing right now. How do um, you know the defense industrial complex innovators in the fleet and just outside the fleet that want to help get in touch? You dropped some uh, some information there, but is there a uh, is there a medium that we can reach out to the Jake and say, hey, how how can I participate? Yeah, I'll I'll start, um, and then Zach can back me up because I'm in my day thirty, I think, something like that, of being at the Jake. Um, so www.ai.mil is going to be the best way for you to sort of just connect with us writ large. I think um, you'll see a little bit of what we're up to. You'll see sort of where we are present uh, from a social media perspective. We have a great social media presence, I think. We're doing a lot on LinkedIn. We're doing a lot on Twitter, et cetera. Um, and so I think you should be able to find us fairly easily. Um, obviously, both Zach and I have our personal emails and, and uh, cell phone you know, information on the slide. So if you guys request the slides, please reach out to us that way. From an industry perspective, we actually have um, a dedicated industry rep, um, Colonel Doug Drakeley, who sits uh, inside DIU out in California and does a lot of our industry interface. Although I believe we're going to be sort of amping up that that um, capability for the Jake potentially in some different locations. So if you're interested in that kind of liaison type of thing, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, you can reach out to myself or Zach or, or just through AI.mil. Um, and then obviously anybody, you know, within DOD or sort of working with DOD in partnership, I think, again, any of the AI.mil or our just generic email addresses, just reach out to us. We'll, we'll direct you to the right place. We are, we're hiring. So please, um, be on the lookout for that. Um, for civilians, I just want to offer, it's really interesting because if you have been in the government um, for as long as I have, so I've been in the DOD and the intel community for about 12 years, <clears throat> um, and having to go through USA jobs, which kind of is the way in which a lot of uh, the civilians have to do this, is probably the most painful thing, one of the most painful things government-wise. Um, and AI.ml actually cuts through that. So you, um, you just basically send your resume and sometimes a cover letter if they ask for one and that's it. Uh, so you get to bypass that and we're actively seeking um, active duty and uh, reservists, uh, guard members. So please, please, please reach out. Uh, we, we definitely want a lot of uh, additional diversity of expertise and thought as Maggie pointed out at the beginning um, as we sort of cultivate this really, really creative, um, uh, powerful team of, of, of thought leaders in the Jake. Zach, what, what did I miss? And anything over to you, Zach? Yeah, thanks, Jacqueline. Um, that was actually a really good soundbite for someone who's only been here for 30 days. Um, so you can't, miss, you can't mess up with our website. You can't go wrong with just connecting with anybody uh, on, on the Jake team. And, and there are ways to get to, to us, and someone will try to find you to the right folks. You know, and we're, we're kind of a startup, like she said, so we're trying to find a, a way to have our portal um, kind of direct everybody to the people that you'd like to get in contact with. You'd click on a national mission initiative and you'd see that, you know, our joint warrior fighting talks about C2 and you're working a C2 problem in the AI space. 
and that would be able to connect you to the joint warfighting team. Um, beyond that, uh, I, I would say that talking to either of us, you know, one of the great thing about the innovation ecosystem is the fact that we just love to help each other out and we want to help each other solve problems. And so while the, the answer may not actually reside in the Jake, we definitely want to know who you are and what you're doing. We want to know what your questions are. We want your user or your, your problem feedback. But we also can act as a connector through the AI spectrum. And so being a catalyst, just through the connecting of human to human, a lot of people have come across my email box, my desk, or, or my Slack channels. And all I've done is literally connect them to someone else and then gone hands off because there's nothing I could actually do for them at that time. And then the last thing I would plug is that, uh, particularly for those that are in the DoD right now, uh, if you're working a problem and you want to come work at the Jake, you don't have to actually be employed by the Jake. You can be detailed if your unit is willing to give you up. And I guarantee you, you're going to go back with not only the connections, but a lot of upskilling that's going to occur there. And you're going to have a strategic view that even the service chiefs at this point don't really have. Thank you for that. Uh, Lucas, so I see that there's a, there are a couple more questions in the queue, but we also want to be respectful of their time and your face popped up. So you let me know uh, if we're cleared hot or if it's time to sign off. So I would just say to, to be respectful of all our, our friends uh, that are viewing's time that we just, we close up shop. But what I would encourage all the panelists to do is go into the Q&A and you can type your responses there. Um, get more coordination with them. And then for the panelists as well, like I see something from Tom to Jared about SOCOM and the UK Ministry of Defense have an effort for virtual reality educational systems um, or perhaps Project Agitare, you know, helping out the National Guard. There's a lot of collaboration and yeah. cross-pollination that we can have. Good. Yeah, that we can have, you know, throughout throughout this uh, event and beyond. So I would, uh, I would encourage all the panelists, um, whether they're online or not, to reach out to each other and see how we can help support each other. 